Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Today we're going to look at the Habiru phenomenon. The Habiru are a group that show up in ancient Near Eastern texts from the 18th century up through the 11th century BC. They're described as a group of people who were uprooted and wandered around. Now, given that description and the fact that the name sounds a lot like the ethnonym Hebrew that we see in the Bible, scholars and lay people alike have suggested that the Habiru and the Hebrews are one and the same. But is that really the case? Today we're going to look at what the Habiru were, where the term comes from, what we can know about them, and what relation they may or may not have to the biblical Hebrews. Let's dig in. As Kyle said, the Habiru appear in historical texts over a very long period of time, from the 18th century through the 11th century. While these people appear in texts from a wide range of places, including Mesopotamia, Anatolia, Egypt, and the Levant, the word seems to refer to a sociological phenomenon. The phenomenon itself is not specific to Syria-Palestine. The term was first recognized in the Amarna letters, which is a, a cache of diplomatic correspondence found at the Egyptian site of El Amarna in the 1880s, and which dates to around the 14th century BC. In these texts, written in Kanano Akkadian, the term Hibiru is used to refer to a social category of people. The term Hibiru in these letters seems to be a rendering of the West Semitic word Apiru, which seems to be the original word used in Syria Palestine to refer to this group of people. So this is the term we will use, even though the term Habiru is perhaps a more widely known term, and Apiru is the rendering of the word from cuneiform sources. But who are these Apiru? Before we answer that question, we need to understand that because this term was used over such a long period of time, its meaning wasn't static. How it was used in one time and place isn't exactly the same as its usage in another time and place. Scholars who have studied the Apiru, like Eva von Dassau, describe Apiru as denoting a social category of mutable content and character in the Middle and Late Bronze Age Near East. Again, this word denotes a sociological category, or a class of people, rather than referring to a specific ethnic group. Lists of people denoted as Apiru make it clear that they do not come from one linguistic or ethnic group, and that many different people could be Apiru. At least originally, it described a class of people who were uprooted from their original social context and then existed outside the bounds of the ordered social setting which used the term. Nadav Na'aman says, common to all the people designated as Habiru is the fact that they were uprooted from their original political and social framework and forced to adapt to a new environment. He discusses a kind of cyclical Apiru phenomenon wherein someone is forced to leave their social setting, their home, village, tribal network, or, and they move beyond the territory that was known to them. This could be to escape war or famine, plague, taxes, debt, compulsory civic service, or any number of social disruptions. Studies of Apiru suggest the most, that most Apiru came from urban or at least sedentarized contexts. They're not typically nomadic originally, though many often took up a nomadic or semi-nomadic existence for a period of time. They then operated outside the boundaries of that new social world and existed on its fringes. They could work for the local authorities as mercenaries or laborers, though they often aggregated together into bands of similarly situated people. These groups were often organized around a kind of charismatic leader figure whose personal charm or capabilities kept the group together. Eventually, these bands could fall apart for a number of reasons. It could be because the local authorities defeated them, or because people within the band integrated back into society from its fringes, or even because the band grew so large that they developed into their own kind of tribal network to made their own ordered society. So they would then cease to be a Piru as they were integrated into an ordered social world again. Now, of course, this Apiru cycle was certainly not limited to Syria-Palestine during the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, but the word Apiru generally refers to individuals who were a part of the cyclical process in this region during this time period. With that in mind, let's take a look at where we see Apiru in both ancient texts and archaeology. As I mentioned, this term has shades of meaning. During the Amarna period, or the 14th century, Apiru was used as a derogatory term. This wasn't always the case. As we see at places like Amari in the 18th century, at Amari, a Piru seems to be a recognized status. If someone is a Piru, they are treated kind of like a refugee. Refugees were not subject to extradition for any offenses they may have committed back in their home country, and 
having a peer status seems, at least in some texts, to be like something similar, an official refugee status. One text from Mari is kind of interesting. It laughs off this idea of extraditing someone who was a Piru because they now serve the king, even though they used to serve the king of another land. A Piru appear in textual sources throughout the Syrian and Levantine world, especially from the 18th to the 14th centuries. This artifact is called the Tikunani prism, named after the kingdom where it was found, and dates to about the 16th century. Tikunani has, was a small Hurrian kingdom, and this prism was commissioned by King Tunip Teshup. It lists the names of several hundred soldiers in his service, men who are listed as a Piru. Of the men listed, most of them have Hurrian names, but some have West Semitic names and one has a Kassite name. It seems these Apiru served as mercenaries or a militia for the king. While most were apparently of ostensibly local Hurrian heritage, not all of them were. We also see that not all Apiru were men. Elsewhere in the Hurrian world, namely at Nuzi, a Hurrian city in the 14th and 15th centuries, we see both men and women listed as Apiru. In these texts, these Apiru enter contracts with wealthy citizens of Nuzi where they take on contractual servitude to survive. The Apiru play a notable role in the early 15th century tale of Idrimi. We plan to do a whole video on Idrimi, but here's a quick summary. Idrimi was the son of the king of the city of Halab, or Aleppo, but he was driven away from his homeland by the king of Mitanni. While he is away from his home, he spends time with Apiru in Canaan. He builds his power and eventually takes the city of Alalak, where he rules. Again, there is a lot to mind in this story, but the Apiru of Canaan play an important role in restoring the fortunes of Adrimi. The reference to Apiru is more matter-of-fact than anything else in this story. It's almost like, of course he was with Apiru because he was an outcast. He was a refugee. Who else would he be with? Now, in the Amarna letters, though, Apiru, are, or their Habiru, is always used in a derogatory way. It's often used the way that we may use the term terrorist. And in the Amar letters, there are people who existed outside the ordered world of both the Pharaoh and the Canaanite city-state system. The Pharaohs don't seem to be particularly concerned with the Piru, whereas local Canaanite leaders were often very concerned about Apiru bands. These kings constantly seek Pharaoh's assistance against bands of Apiru and threaten that if help doesn't come, the king's lands will go over to the Habiru. We only see the pharaohs respond to the threats of these Habiru in a couple of cases, namely Abdi Ashirta and Aziru, who was Abdi Ashirta's son, who were both based in Amir, an Amuru. And when these rebellious leaders force the issue and rise to the level of legitimate threats to Egyptian interests. Now, the phrase to become Habiru is almost like a stock phrase that appears in the Amarna letters to refer to those who abandon their social and political obligations to pharaoh and their Canaanite lords. Yet, we should also keep in mind that in these letters, the Canaanite kings had to justify their behavior to the pharaoh. To call your enemy Habiru was essentially to say, this person is disloyal to the pharaoh and exists outside the boundaries of ordered society. They, they're an outlaw, so any action against them is justified. So modern readers would be wise to critically evaluate accusations of being a Habiru made by ambitious Canaanite kings against their neighbors and rivals. Rib Hada of Byblos is particularly liberal both with his accusations of being a Piru and with the details of his stories, but he's not the only one who makes such accusations. There's a series of letters from the kings of Shechem and Gezer where the king of Shechem, Labayu, is probably credibly accused of working with the Apiru. In another letter, his son is accused of cavorting with the Piru, which Labayu perhaps less credibly claims to not know about. Whatever the truth of the matter, it seems clear that Apiru were a part of life in the Southern Levant in the Late Bronze Age. Egypt doesn't seem to be particularly troubled with them, even if the vassal kings are. The Apiru, again, except for in Amiru, don't pose a significant threat to Egyptian imperial rule, even if they do pose significant threat to the local ruling dynasties. The existence of Apiru seems to have been a natural part of social and political life in Syria-Palestine, particularly in the Late Bronze Age. The Apiru phenomenon seems to disappear during the early Iron Age. Hieratic inscriptions dating to the 12th and 11th centuries are the last historical texts which mention them. With the collapse of the Bronze Age world, it seems there may have been an increase in the frequency of Apiru, and the lack of reference to them is likely due to a general lack of sources during this period and not an actual decline in the phenomenon. With the rise of the ethnicizing secondary states of the Iron Age, it seems either they were fewer Apiru or they were called by a different name as they passed under the textual record around the 11th century. Unless, of course, the Apiru did not disappear, but became Hebrew. So a lot of the discussion about the Apiru comes from this, this conflation of the Apiru with the Hebrews. Are these the same thing or not? 
To answer that question, it may be most helpful to look at where the term apiru comes from so we can see if it's related to the word Hebrew or not. Easy enough, right? Well, no. There's no widespread agreement on the etymology of the term apiru, and different theories tend to be backed into from whether you think that the apiru or habiru and the Hebrews are the same, unrelated, or somewhere in between. Initially, the commonality between the words was taken for granted, but subsequent scholarship has called into serious question how apiru and ivri, the Hebrew word we translate as Hebrew, could be related. Noted scholars and epigraphers like Anson Rainey vociferously deny any linguistic connection, but nowadays some scholars note that there is a possible linguistic connection. Now, the linguistic argument involves B to P devoicing and translations of voiceless velar fricatives, and we just aren't going to get into that right now. Just know that there are legitimate arguments for linking habiru or apiru with ivri or hebrew. There are, however, other options, and one I want to mention comes from Daniel Fleming, who cites evidence from texts at Mari. While the documents at Mari are in Akkadian, there are indications that a West Semitic language was used at Mari, particularly the sources Fleming is citing. Let me note that in certain texts from Hari, there's a term, habarum or hebrum, which comes from a Yemenite, which is West Semitic root word, abarum, which means to depart, as in to depart from one's home. This is not like I departed my home to run an errand, but I left for an extended period of time, as in the people who depart their community with their herds. It can refer to people who do seasonal migrations with their animals in a transhuman cycle, or it can refer to an outlaw or anyone who leaves their community for an extended period. Fleming suggests then that Habiru then were the departed ones, those who left their community and sought refuge in another land. If Fleming is right, then this may be the commonly shared root for both Apiru or Habiru and Hebrew or Ibri. The words weren't equatable per se, but they may derive from the same root for those who depart from home. So are the Apiru and the Hebrews one and the same? So are the Habiru and the Hebrews the same? Well, again, it's complicated, but mostly, no. If apiru is a social designation for those who are outcast on the fringes of society after having left their home, then we can't say that Hebrews are the same thing. Hebrew has an ethnic connotation within its shades of meaning. It's a gentilic, and that's not something we see with apiru. Anyone can become an apiru. A Canaanite, an Amorite, a Hittite, a Hurrian, anyone. It's a social status one takes on for a time before reintegrating back into the ordered social world. Now, this is not how the word Hebrew is used in the Hebrew Bible. To be Hebrew is to be inextricably linked with the people of Israel. But certain texts within the Bible seem to suggest that not all Israelites were Hebrews, or at least that Hebrew, like Apiru, had different shades of meaning. In the Hebrew Bible, the term Hebrew, or Ibrim, is used most in texts dealing with the pre-monarchic period, especially with the Israelites in Egypt and in accounts with the Philistines. For example, Potiphar's wife refers to Joseph as this Hebrew and that Hebrew. Pharaoh speaks to the Hebrew midwives about Hebrew women. Pharaoh's daughter identifies the infant Moses as one of the Hebrew babies. In the plague narratives, God instructs Moses to say, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. So, the phrase is one commonly used by Egyptians for the Israelites, but also as a self-identifying term by a group we may call Israelites. In accounts with the Philistines, like in 1 Samuel 4, the Philistines refer to the Hebrew camp and encourage one another to not be subject to the Hebrews. While the Philistines had disdain for all of their hill country rivals, they seemed to use Hebrew as a particular term of contempt. David is called a Hebrew by the Philistines, while David is serving as a mercenary for the king of Gath. Perhaps most interesting, though, is in 1 Samuel 13 and 14, we're told how Saul was going to fight the Philistines, but the Philistine force was so large that Saul's men deserted him. We read that the Israelites hid in caves and thickets and among rocks and pits and cisterns, and that some Hebrews crossed back over the Jordan, the opposite direction from the Philistines. But Jonathan did not lose heart, and he and his armor bearer attacked a Philistine outpost and were victorious. The Israelites mustered, and we read, those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim 
heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. It seems in these passages that Hebrews and Israelites are treated as distinct groups. The juxtaposition of these two words indicates that they weren't always used interchangeably. In 1 Samuel 14, 21, it seems that there were Hebrews amongst the camp of the Philistines. And when things turned against the Philistines, the Hebrews turned and fought with Saul. In these passages in the Hebrew Bible, the term Hebrew seems to, at least sometimes, be used in a derogatory manner. And it's often used to refer to Israelites who are either foreigners in another land or who are in servitude of some sort. Now, there's a lot of overlap with that use of Hebrew and how a piru is used elsewhere in the ancient world. It would make sense that these two words may have derived from a common root word. It seems some Hebrews were like a piru, but not all a piru were Hebrews. Naaman makes the case that Hebrew was originally used as a kind of social ethnonym to refer to people who operated like a piru and were uprooted from their homeland. These were a kind of Israelite who were like a piru. In literature, it was used as a derogatory term by Israel's enemies, and only later did the name take on a more ethnic connotation. This happened in the far more settled social world of the ethnicizing secondary states, wherein a piru-like behavior was less of a salient feature. So, originally Hebrew had significant semantic overlap with a piru, and only over time did the more social descriptor of Hebrew come to have an ethnic connotation. Now, before we move on, I do want to note, we're not saying that the Apiru mentioned in the Amarna letters are the Hebrews of the Bible, even if the Hebrews are Apiru like Israelites. The term Apiru in the Amarna letters and earlier does not carry any ethnic connotation in the way that Hebrew does. The ethnic group called Hebrews are not in the Amarna letters or at Mari or Nuzi or elsewhere. To see the Apiru in the Amarna letters as equating to the Israelites, one must also grapple with whether the Apiru at Nuzi and Tukunani in the 15th century were also Israelites. Were the Apiru at Mari in the 18th century Israelites? If they're in the Amarna letters, why not everywhere in that the term appears? Equating the Apiru of the Amarna letters with the Israelites leads to either intellectual inconsistency or problematic interpretations of early Israelite history. Instead, it's better to understand Israelite ethnogenesis, the formation of a national ethnic identity of which the Hebrews are a part, as beginning after the Amarna period. The Hebrews are a part of the larger Apiru social phenomenon, not the sum total of that phenomenon. They may be related, but they are not identical. Wherever you land on the Apiru Hebrew linguistic equation, there is no doubt that bands of people who fit the Apiru description do appear in the Bible. There are people in the Bible who behave like the Apiru bands of the Bronze Age, and we can draw many parallels between certain stories we see in the Hebrew Bible and known accounts involving the Apiru. While there are several cases of biblical figures that fit the Apiru cycle, even if they aren't called Apiru, we'll only mention a few. First is the case of Jephthah in Judges 11. This is a classic case of someone following the Apiru cycle. When we're introduced to Jephthah, we're told that he was a great warrior, as well as the son of an unnamed prostitute. His father is said to be Gilead. Now, this may mean that his father could be any number of men, like any of the men of Gilead, given his mother's profession. Or it could mean that his father was actually named Gilead. Either way, we read that his father had other sons who forced Jephthah to depart from his homeland of Gilead to a land called Tob. Now, it's not clear where this is, but it may be north of Gilead, southeast of the Sea of Galilee. One of the Amarna letters mentions a place which may be the same place. In Tob, Jephthah gathers to himself a gang of scoundrels who followed his leadership. He lived away from his homeland with other similarly situated men until he was called back home to lead his tribe in a military conflict. While he's never called an Apiru, Jephthah fits the Apiru cycle, and the Jephthah story is set in the early Iron Age, a period when some sources still mention Apiru, so the social phenomenon was still salient to some degree or another. Elsewhere in Judges, we see Apiru as supporting characters in the story of Abimelech, son of Gideon, in Judges 9. 
In the story, Abimelech goes to the people of Shechem and seeks to rule there as the sole leader. Now, Abimelech is not an Apiru. He never leaves his home. In fact, his claim to rulership is based on his kinship with the people of Shechem. And this is just ambition, pure and simple. Because he's related to the people of Shechem, they give him some money, and he uses it to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. This upstart king uses his funds to hire a mercenary Apiru force to help secure his power base. This is the same charge the kings of Canaan leveled against Labayu, also king of Shechem, all the way back in the 14th century. In fact, these stories are so similar, a king of Shechem using Apiru to help establish his power, that some scholars have suggested they are the same figures. Abimelech is Labayu. But we don't hold to this. Most scholars don't. Instead, what seems most likely is that these are two iterations of a pattern of using disaffected and uprooted men who had no place in society as mercenaries. Marginal lands like the highlands of Canaan around Shechem would certainly have attracted such bands. So, they would have been readily available for characters like Abimelech and Labayu to employ. Perhaps the best example of a biblical figure who follows the Apiru cycle, one which we see other historical figures following, is that of King David. In fact, his story mirrors that of Idrimi quite closely. Again, we're not suggesting that the two stories are actually related, nor are most scholars who study this. However, it does seem that either the narrators of these stories are following a set genre, so the stories follow a similar pattern, or maybe and, these stories are similar because they reflect persistent and repeated historical episodes where men go out to be like a Piru, only to return in triumph as kings. When you study the story of David, you can see it does have many of the same elements of the Apiru cycle, but it also has many semantic markers that are in other biblical Apiru stories. Let's quickly review that story. David starts as an up-and-coming figure in Saul's court, but he's forced to flee from Saul and goes into hiding. He goes to Gath, the leading city of the Philistines, whom he had built his career fighting against, and essentially seeks refugee status. He realizes he also isn't safe among the Philistines, so he flees again. We read he went to a cave in Adulam, and all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. David becomes the head of a band of warriors, numbered sometimes at 400, but usually at 600, who wander in the wilderness going from stronghold to stronghold. Now this number 600 is likely a stock number more than an actual reflection of reality. This is probably meant to signal to the reader that this is a particular type of group of soldiers, an Apiru-like band. This band moves from one locale to another, fleeing the reach of the ordered, settled world, while also gaining followers as they go, including a priest and a prophet. And we'll note that Adrimi had a diviner with him in his travels as well. We see in 1 Samuel 25 that David and his men operate something like a mafia racket. Now, this is an oversimplification, and there is a lot going on in 1 Samuel 25. But for now, we can note that it's the kind of activity we may expect of Apiru bands. David eventually enters into the service of the king of Gath with his Apiru band. Remember, this was something that we see Apiru doing at Mari, going from serving one king to serving another rival king. David was given Ziklag as a fiefdom for him and his band. From there, he raided other nomadic groups who caused trouble for the Israelites in the area. After Saul died, David was crowned king in Hebron, and his band of Apiru are said to have come to him at the cave in Adulam, where he first, we first read about the discontented men coming to David. These mighty men, who led his core military units, became his core power base. Now, there are elements in the story of David that appear in other stories that likewise point to the characters fitting in the Apiru cycle mold. In Judges 18, we see the Danites leaving their tribal allotment to attack and resettle the city of Laish, coercing a priest to come with them along the way. When the priest's former benefactor protests, they are warned that if they keep protesting, they will be amongst angry men. Now, this phrase doesn't come across in most English translations, but it's the same phrase used to describe the men who surrounded David at the cave of Adulam. 
So, the story of the Danite migration seems to have a number of literary signals similar to those in the David story that point to this being about an Apiru-like band of Israelites, or Hebrews, leaving their ancestral homeland to find fortunes in another territory where they resettle into the ordered world. Another story that is similar to that of David is that of Rezan. This was an Aramean figure we read about in 1 Kings 11. He was driven from home by the king Hadadezer. While in exile, we read that Rezan gathered a band of men around him and became their leader. After David defeated Hadadezer, Rezan took his opportunity to seize Damascus and take control. Rezan's story is only one verse long, but it seems to mirror David's story quite closely. He was driven to exile by his king. In exile, he drew a band of men around him. After the prior king was defeated, he took the opportunity to seize power. The story of Sheba's revolt in 2 Samuel 20 has some interesting linguistic indicators that his rebellion included an Apiru-like band as well. It seems that even King David wasn't immune to the tables turning on him forcing him to put down rebellious bands like the one that had helped him gain power. All these examples point to the Apiru phenomenon as a common part of the Israelite world that's largely lost on us today. Understanding this phenomenon can help us better piece together parts of the biblical narrative that might not make sense to us on the surface. While we can't equate all Hebrews with the Apiru, we can see that Apiru bands were an important part of their history, even up to the rise of David as king over Israel. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, we've included some references and resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, be sure to subscribe and check out our video on the Amarna Letters or our overview of the late Bronze Age. You can also check out our website beneaththebible.com and follow us on social media at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.